It's time to start. Welcome to today's uh, CS slash NetSys seminar. Uh, it is our pleasure to, uh, to have um, Dan Marino, who is a technical director at the Research uh, uh, Lab of Symantec in LA. Um, before I, before I, um, uh, I let the speaker start, um, this is a joint CS and NetSys um, seminar. So for the students, you know where to check in, um, and I will give the, the, the code at the end. So thanks, Dan, for taking the time to visit us. And uh, you have been to Symantec uh, since 2007, right? Before right. that, you were at UCLA. Uh, and you have worked on many things related to secure software and uh, systems. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Athena. Let's see if I can get the microphone working there. All right, so thanks. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I am going to tell you about uh, some projects that we have going on in the research labs around uh, how we deal with sort of the changing threat landscape. Um, but uh, before I do that, I'm actually going to talk to you a little bit about just Symantec Research Labs, because you might say, hey, Symantec has a research lab. I didn't know that. So let me introduce uh, us first. Uh, and then after that, I'll talk a little bit about a threat landscape study that some colleagues did uh, on the Internet of Things. Uh, and finally end with how we're dealing with the increase uh, in encrypted traffic and threats hiding in encrypted traffic and what we can do to tackle that. Uh, so first, a little bit about SRL. Uh, it's been around for 16 years now, founded in 2002, and I've been there since uh, 2011. Uh, it's made up of about 20 researchers. Uh, we're trying to grow that a little bit. We are, you know, we welcome people with expertise in lots of different areas. Obviously, machine learning is huge uh, in security right now, uh, both for sort of doing things like anomaly detection and uh, um, for building, uh, building models to classify malware, all kinds of things. Uh, but we always have room for people with systems expertise, graph theory, PL, uh, and other stuff. Uh, we've got people working, researchers in different areas, in Mountain View up in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm in Culver City up in the Los Angeles area. We also have an office that's like in the, in the south of France in the French Riviera. I haven't had a chance to visit that, but I'm going to get that in the budget for <laughs> next year, I'm hoping. We'll see. Uh, and we're also excited because we're opening up a new lab in Germany uh, that's going to be really focused on privacy and, and doing research and, and helping uh, increase privacy. Uh, so our goal really is to deliver innovative research that's relevant to security and privacy. And we do it in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, we participate in the academic community, um, publishing and, and participating in program uh, committees. Uh, we work on producing intellectual property for our company, for Symantec. Uh, and we're a very small portion uh, of the company, but we actually generate a lot of the intellectual property. We file about a quarter of the patents each year uh, come from our group. Uh, and then it's always great when we can transfer some of that forward-looking research into products that actually get out there and help our customers. And we have a pretty good track record. Uh, this is a hard thing to do as a research lab in industry. Um, but we have a pretty good track record of transferring some of our research uh, and, and getting it into different products. Um, so some of the areas that we are currently really interested in that we think are the most uh, interesting things in the security field right now are, first of all, privacy and identity. Like I mentioned, we're going to be opening up a new lab. Um, we need to tackle the problems of, you know, increasingly more and more of our transactions have an online component. And we need to do something better than just having a username and password at every site we log into and giving them all kinds of information that they sort of store in their own way and it's all over and there's data breaches. How can we sort of bring some sanity to this and, uh, and create sort of identity layers and safe ways of sharing information uh, we think there's some really interesting stuff in that going forward. Uh, we're interested, like I said, in machine learning, in particular in how do we uh, guard against attacks against machine learning models. Um, so uh, how do we deal with these adversarial attacks? How do we make our models robust to those attacks? How do we make sure that the models are actually kind of explainable and debuggable? Because if you can't kind of explain why it's doing what it's doing, it becomes difficult to know whether you're under attack. And we're also interested in fairness in those models. Um, and you can see the other list of things here, always interested in system security, in assessing risk, in the Internet of Things. And these bottom two, we have sort of less uh, going on right now, but we're really interested in, in breaking into those and finding collaborations um, with universities and with people in other uh, disciplines in order to handle these sort of social good and human interaction aspects of security. Um, there's actually a 
um, a program going on within Symantec right now that is uh, trying to help um, people who grew up in the foster care system because they're disproportionately at risk for identity theft. Uh, and so reaching out and trying to, to help them uh, do what we can with that. But there's, there's a whole list of other groups that are disproportionately targeted uh, by online attacks. And so whatever we can do there would be great. And we're also sort of interested in the, we don't have any people who have expertise in HCI or psychology in our lab directly, but we're kind of interested in looking at that area to see how can we nudge people in the right direction to make really good security and privacy decisions. Um, because really the human still is kind of the, the weakest link uh, in our security a lot of the time. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a, uh, a little plug for SRL. Um, and we're always interested looking for interns and, and collaborations. So let me know uh, if you're interested in that. All right, so now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about this Internet of Things threat landscape study. Uh, this was done by a couple of my colleagues in France, Pierre Antoine and Yoon. And uh, they were kind enough to lend me their slides. They, uh, they presented this at uh, RAID 2018. And uh, hopefully I can, I can do their, uh, their work some justice here. So uh, IoT devices have been around for a long time, uh, whether it's routers, IP cameras, uh, your refrigerator. Um, but uh, it's only recently that we've been sort of seeing sort of high profile attacks. Uh, and probably the most high profile has been some some of the biggest denial of service attacks that we've ever seen. Uh, so it, it was made big headlines when uh, Brian Krebs' website, uh, he's a security journalist, was attacked uh, in, uh, in 2016 then, and it was the largest that had ever been seen at the time. And then, you know, in the following months, we actually saw even bigger attacks. And all of these were not coming from typical, you know, laptops or desktops or servers, they were uh, routers and cameras and this kind of thing that we're all reaching out and uh, sending way too much traffic that the site could handle and causing it to crash. So that's one type of attack that we've seen. Uh, another is we've actually seen them participating in spam campaigns. We see attacks where they actually can you know, physically damage the device and, and uh, cause you to brick your router. Uh, and perhaps, at least for me, the most unsettling is uh, Fairly recently, we saw we, we got news about this VPN filter, which turns out to be really widely distributed. Uh, it's on lots, you know, more than half a million uh, so far known uh, routers, mostly I believe. And uh, looking at the code, it turns out that there's a module in there that actually is made to eavesdrop on um, industrial control systems like SCADA communications and stuff like that. So you know that the goal this is probably a state actor, and the goal here is. Uh, to do industrial espionage, so that's, that's a little scary too. And then there's a bunch out there that we have no idea what they do. Right? There's this uh, Hajime, I think it's called, and it, uh, the, the best guess is that this is a vigilante type white hat hacker who's out there trying to protect vulnerable devices <laughs> from other botnets <laughs> going to attack it. Um, hopefully, that's, hopefully they remain benevolent. We'll, we'll see what happens in the future. There's a few others like that that haven't really participated in the attacks, but they are spreading. So, uh, like I said, you know, this stuff's been around for a long time, and it's not news that this is an increase in attack surface. You know, this is something where we could see attacks. Uh, and there were proof of concepts way back in 2008. Um, but what's sort of changed is this steep adoption, obviously. So we're seeing a 25% increase each year. Uh, the anticipate that there's going to be 30 billion IoT devices by 2022. Uh, and it's a little bit... It also has some different challenges from the traditional kind of malware landscape, which mostly has been kind of Windows focused, um, because now we have a whole bunch of OSs, uh, Linux in particular, but others as well, different architectures, uh, and devices that have sort of limited computing resources. So sort of your conventional on-device approaches aren't going to work. So we're seeing the attacks, but we still don't have a great idea of exactly how these things are spreading and how many are out there. And so Pierre Antoine and Yoon wanted to do a uh, sort of a broad study of the landscape and see if they could see what's, what's actually happening out there. And uh, an approach that often gets used when you want to do something like this is to, to deploy honeypots. Uh, so you stick some vulnerable devices out there on the network and you hope that people attack them and you try and watch what they're doing. Uh, and there's sort of, in the IoT honeypot world, there's a spectrum from low interaction honeypots up to high interaction honeypots. So with the low interaction ones, 
uh, these are really just very shallow shim services that kind of expose a network interface that might be uh, the subject of someone trying to, to intrude, uh, but they don't have anything beneath them. Sometimes they're not even running a real operating system, so they're not even really capable of getting infected in the same way uh, as, as a real device is. Um, and so that has some advantages because you don't have to worry about how to like reset them after they get infected. Um, and they can also kind of appear like lots of different devices, like accept different, uh, different default passwords from different uh, types of IoT devices. Um, and, and so all of that's great, but they're also easy for an attacker to figure out. You know, once they've tried to attack it, they realize, hey, this isn't really a, a device. This is a honeypot. I'm not going to talk to that honeypot in the future because I don't want them watching what I do. Maybe I even tell my friends about that and, and sort of avoid it altogether. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum are these high interaction honeypots, and that could be as far up as actually deploying real devices uh, and, and trying to monitor what's going on. Um, that can be difficult because you might not be able to install software on that device, so how do you monitor it effectively? Uh, also, if it is a real device, you've got a scalability problem because you'd have to sort of have lots of them, and once it did get infected, how do you sort of set it back to a, to a clean state? Uh, and there's the ethical issues around um, are you going to be participating in an attack and helping the threats to spread uh, with your honeypot, which you'd prefer not to do. Uh, and um, so the other option would be to emulate these, but there, there isn't as, you know, there's lots of different hypervisors that you can use to run uh, commodity operating systems. But for IoT devices, it's a little, it's a little trickier nowadays, and so you, you, have to, um, you have to work a little harder to do emulation, but that's probably a better option than deploying real devices. So for this study, um, we deployed both, uh, both low interaction and high interaction honeypots, just to try and get the broadest view possible of what was going on out there. We used lots of previous work, lots of open source uh, software in order to do this, uh, especially on the low interaction side. On the high interaction side, um, I believe there were three devices, two browsers and a camera uh, that were emulated uh, using the QMU uh, emulator. and. Um, for the routers, we were able to use some previous work out of CMU uh, from David Brunley's group called Firmadyne that actually you can take the extracted firmware image and it uses some heuristics to try and make QMU appear like the type of router hardware and, uh, and, and gets it to work pretty much out of the box. Uh, for the camera, that fails because when it tries to like actually get a camera image, the whole thing kind of freaks out and crashes. Um, so mm -hmm. there was sort of a different approach there where you uh, extracted took the firmware image, extracted all of the different network-facing apps, put them together in a realistic way, uh, and sort of emulated them on a, on a typical stock kernel. So, okay, that's how these were deployed. And then we're, they're, they're out there, and uh, I think they deployed them in uh, three different geographies, um, somewhere on the order of like 50 different IP addresses, uh, and, and sort of let them get attacked. And uh, they're sort of monitoring them the whole time and then trying to enrich the data that they're, that they're gathering, right? So there's various types of enrichment they did. They're looking at the source of these attacks that are coming in, who's trying to connect uh, to my network services, uh, and then using Shodan to see, can we see that this is another router? So is this like worm-like behavior? Uh, or is this actually, you know, we, we can't figure that out. It's actually coming directly from some attacker server. Um, we also look at uh, IP reputation, IP blacklists, okay? So Symantec uh, has its own and also gathers uh, data from lots of other sources in order to create uh, blacklists of IPs that have known to be participating in attacks. So are any of these IPs that uh, are the sources of the attacks or from which we see it download uh, binaries after, after the infection, uh, are any of these on blacklists? Uh, and then if they do download binaries, we can then try to look at those and see are these known malware? Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with VirusTotal, it's an aggregator of lots of different companies, um, virus, uh, the disposition for various uh, executable files. So Symantec contributes to that as well as lots of other security companies. Uh, so we look and say, hey, is this known uh, malware? And this way we can classify you know, which botnet is attacking us if we can, if we can answer that question. Uh, and, uh, and then we also use IDS signatures, I think some custom written ones to see about particular vulnerabilities that might be, ex be being exploited, and then some snort signatures that we know are associated with the command and control traffic for some of these botnets. So by doing all of that, then we can sort of classify the attacks, see, what, see what's going on. So that's the setup. Let me tell you some of the results. Um, first of all, 
we were kind of amazed at the number of connections and disturbed, of course. So there's, <laughs> there are, the attackers are out there, and they really are, uh, you know, you don't, we didn't advertise these things. We just put them out on the open internet, and then 37 million times over these six or seven months, um, people are trying to connect uh, to them, and presumably all of those are attacks or some kind of scam. More than 65% of the sources were not on any blacklist at the time that they came through. So even if you had like your ISP or you have some other network device that's trying to like block traffic from known bad IPs, it's not even going to help. You know, 35% of the time, You're, they're still going to get through. Um, and the top three, there was lots of services that uh, that were open on these various devices, but HTTP, Telnet, and SSH are very common and were very commonly attacked. Uh, the most common attack, and this actually matches with what people knew from sort of looking at the uh, malware binaries is, uh, uh, and other studies of, the, of these botnets, is that uh, default passwords are the biggest problem. Uh, and so password either brute forcing or guessing different default passwords uh, was how <coughs> 11 million successful attacks uh, took place on, on these honeypots. Um, but what was interesting and what was less known was that the, uh, the authors of these IoT malware are actually starting to exploit vulnerabilities uh, that are um, you know, published as CVEs or whatnot. So uh, we saw on the HTTP side, we saw uh, 411 exploitations of 12 different vulnerabilities uh, across our, our three high interaction honeypots. Uh, and most of these were credential disclosure vulnerabilities. So this isn't just guessing the password. This is where you can actually exploit a flaw to reset the password or to, um, I think on one of the routers, it was like you could, uh, without having the, the current password, you could set up a cloud account and kind of just start administering it uh, through the uh, manufacturer's website uh, remotely, at which point you could change the password and do whatever you want. Um, and so that's kind of a sign of increasing sophistication. We've kind of pictured all of these things as, you know, using default passwords on Telnet, and it's kind of like, well, let's fix this by having the manufacturers, you know, stop shipping with Telnet, use SSH for one thing, and also don't uh, uh, don't use default passwords. But if we're starting to see these sort of vulnerability exploitation, exploitation that's sort of showing more sophistication uh, in the cyber criminals as they're trying to, to make sure that this uh, continues to be viable for them. And the top two most exploited vulnerabilities actually were disclosed during this study, and we started seeing them being exploited uh, within a couple of weeks uh, after, uh, after the disclosure. <clears throat> uh, in terms of where the, uh, after the intrusion took place, where they were getting their payloads, their malware payloads, uh, they came from 832 different IP addresses. <coughs> Most of them were only around for a five day, for a few days, and this uh, matches with the fact that you know maybe they are getting blacklisted, but they need to stay ahead of those blacklists, right? So they move around uh, so that it's, it's harder to sort of block uh, traffic from them. Uh, and an, another sign of this sort of change, they they're still are not as sophisticated as the malware that we see on on Windows, for instance. Um, the common thing to do when you're trying to deal with command and control traffic or figuring out where you download your payload from is to use something like a domain generation algorithm. So that means you have sort of two layers of indirection. You've got, you can change the IP behind some particular domain, but you also have different domains that you can, that the software can try as backups that are uh, deterministically uh, generated from an algorithm. Uh, and so you see that a lot in, in software on Windows now. Here, they're like just using a single IP. It's like they don't, they're, they're not as sophisticated, and maybe that's because they don't need to be, right? They only work as hard as they have to. So, so far, they've been able to get away without doing this. But we should look in the future for them to start uh, being more uh, complex. Uh, and 85% of the malware binaries that were dropped were not yet known uh, by any of the AV vendors as being malware. Uh, so that's, that's also problematic. Um, but they did do a little experiment here that's interesting because whenever you, you know, signatures are always going to, never the best way to defend against malware because they can always uh, tweak their binaries so that it changes the way it looks and then it's, you know, you need to write a new signature and it's, it's, it's painful, right? So you always want to do some kind of behavioral analysis if you can. Uh, and, and they sort of, uh, Pierre and, and uh, Yoon showed that uh, it might be possible to identify what botnet uh, is, uh, is, 
attacking you based on the commands that they're issuing over these telnet sessions. So they basically took the, the commands that were issued right after intrusion. Um, I don't think they were treating it as a sequence. They were treating it as a set of commands and then clustering them. And there were a few big clusters where you couldn't kind of uh, figure out which, which botnet it was. But then there were lots of different pure clusters as well uh, where they saw that their clustering al algorithm matched what eventually ended up being assigned to that, uh, the label that the, was assigned to the uh, malware that got downloaded. So there is some hope that we could uh, sort of use some of these techniques, which we use on the Windows malware side, also to classify uh, IoT malware. So once this all happens, you know, what, what are the attacks that take place? Um, well, basically, all of they, they were monitoring using uh, snort signatures and, and capturing the network streams uh, what, all of the internet, what all of the network traffic looked like after infection. And the main types of traffic they saw were uh, scans or attempts to sort of uh, propagate themselves, uh, communication with their command and control infrastructure, and we also did observe some attacks, uh, not nearly as big as the ones that we that I showed on that first slide, but uh, we actually, and, and by the way, we were, any time that the traffic looked like attack traffic, we were blocking that so that we were trying not to participate uh, in, these, in these DDoS attacks. Um, but we, we saw 41 uh, DDoS attacks during this period, and five of them were high volume. Um, I'm not actually sure why people are attacking gaming servers. Some of you may have better ideas of um, <laughs> you know, how that would be a, a monetary benefit to someone, or maybe it's just street cred, I don't know. Um, some ISPs and a university were also attacked. Um, so some of the takeaways from this is that yes, these sort of kind of silly, stupid, telnet-based uh, default password vulnerabilities are still the main way that they seem to be spreading, but they are getting more sophisticated, and, and we're going to see more of these vulnerability-based uh, exploits, we think. And what that means is we really need to, to um, both users and the manufacturers, and maybe users can put some pressure on the manufacturers, uh, to actually keep these things up to date, because typically patches have not been issued for IoT devices very often. Uh, and we think that's going to be really important if we're going to sort of try and guard against this. Um, Mirai, which was sort of the, uh, what launched all of those huge DDoS attacks, uh, is still the botnet that is dominating the threat landscape, but there's a bunch of others uh, that are catching up to it. And uh, part of the scary thing is we don't know what some of them are doing. We sort of know that they're out there and spreading, but, but not exactly what they plan to do. Um, DDoS attacks are still the most common thing, uh, and although the ecosystem doesn't seem to be quite as sophisticated, uh, it, we're seeing some increasing sophistication. Uh, and so the concern is that, that this sort of threat landscape is, is quickly catching up to the traditional uh, Windows landscape, and, and we wonder what types of other attacks we might see. Um, maybe as these devices become a little bit more powerful, we might actually see you know, crypto mining going on on your, uh, on your router. Um, so that is it for this section of the talk. Does anyone have any, any questions about any of that? Yeah, so uh, are they actually changing binaries on the, on the router for IT devices? Usually you cannot really change on the router to flash on the router. So uh, that is, they are adding binaries, and I think that these sort of busy box implementations on the routers, they may be able to uh, to do, I don't know if they need to do a reboot, but they are, uh, so okay, here's the thing. First of all, some of them are not persistent. Uh, they are able to get a process uh, launched in memory, but they don't persist through router reboots. So that's that's what happens with some of them. Although I do know, and I'm, I'm not certain how this happens, that we are now also seeing um, some that are, are able to persist through reboots of the router. So how that relates to the flashing, I'm, I'm actually not certain. Yeah? Were there any exploits that were used uh, before actually they get disclosed? So that is a good question, and I hope that they have the PCAP traces. The, the main way that you can figure that out, right, is by doing a retrospective analysis. Um, and we do this a lot when it comes to like malware binaries, right? We, we, we keep the hashes of the binaries around. We didn't know they were malware at the time, but then uh, we, we look back and we say, okay, how effective were we? Uh, 
at, at find, at, for instance, we do this when we're trying to figure out how effective behavioral analysis is. Um, you, you say, okay, would, did our behavioral analysis catch things that, that we later, after the fact, realized were malware? So what we need to do is wait for some of these CVEs to come out and then go back and look at those peak write signatures for them and run those PCAP traces uh, through the, the signatures again. So as this time, because this was pretty recent work, uh, we don't know anything like that. We'd have to manually inspect some that look suspicious or do this retrospective thing that I'm talking about. Yeah? So, so since uh, your analysis is focused on this on malware-based attacks, right? So there's also a recent trend about the fileless attacks. So are you, uh, were you able to, uh, to uh, observe anything on uh, that then? So um, I don't know if the fileless attacks are big in the Internet of Things world yet. They certainly are in, in Windows world, uh, people using these scripts and things to sort of never put a binary on the disk. Um, I, we didn't see anything like that. That doesn't mean that it definitely didn't occur because we weren't necessarily um, looking for, so I think it would be interesting to know how many of these Telnet attacks uh, were sort of long scripts and didn't ever result in a binary being downloaded. And I think that there were some of those, and I don't know if, if we've done any further exploration into whether or not those could actually represent some sort of a fileless attack. Yeah, um, I, yeah actually, actually, um, um, yeah, we can definitely talk about this later, because um, so, so, so me and myself did a research into this uh, that earlier. Mm -hmm. So we actually deployed this cloud-based hotnet, uh, th 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 this, this honeypot. And then we captured this um, this SSH tunneling attack. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. That's a, like yeah. a, about IoT device like the fileless attack. So yeah, but, interesting. We should talk about that. Yeah, but I think it is that our our honeypot is, is in a very limited scale, but yours are much much better. So so hopefully you guys can um, can can like um, I don't know whether you guys want to focus more on that one because that one will be interesting because there there will, will not be any no signature right something so that will be much more challenging. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more question. Uh, did any of the devices like yours subscribe to the Yes. And, uh, and I can't answer for your Pierre Antoine and Yoon, but uh, they were doing their best to, it's a fine line to walk with these high interaction honeypots because you want to allow the command and control traffic to go through because that's kind of part of the reason you're doing the high interaction is you want to see what the post-infection behavior looks like. So you need to let them sort of talk to their infrastructure, figure out who they're supposed to attack, download appropriate payloads. But when you see worm-like behavior, you want to kind of stop that because you don't want to be participating in the propagation of the virus. But we definitely did see traffic and block traffic uh, that, was, that looked like propagation traffic. Cool. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's move on. Let's see what time it is, okay. So now I'm going to talk about uh, a different sort of change in the threat landscape, which is the increasing use of en encryption. Um, so this is a, a graph I, I borrowed from Google's website uh, that just shows that, uh, that TLS uh, adoption is increasing rapidly, right? So uh, back in 2015, it was already pretty common, but it was less than 50% of page loads uh, that, were, that were coming over uh, uh, HTTPS. And today, it's more than 75% uh, in most places. So that's great. I mean, it's it's good for our privacy. It's 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 better that we uh, that we have this this uh, encryption out there. The problem is is that cyber criminals use it too, uh, and uh, we've had lots of anecdotal evidence of this. Um, Chris Larson blogged back in 2016 that they saw the the number of malware samples that were using TLS jumped from 500 per month to 30,000. So these huge jumps, and the same with uh, encrypted command and control traffic from 1,000 servers that were. Uh, directing their botnets over uh, TLS to up to 200,000 uh, in, in a quarter. Uh, and from our own uh, collection of malware, we have uh, 1.7 million malware samples just from the last year that we see are using TLS in some way. Uh, and uh, so this is, you know, this is a problem, and the reason that they're doing this is because it makes it harder for sort of traditional detection methods, signatures, uh, IDS signatures and whatnot to, to find them. So how can we detect this malicious activity, but also uh, respect uh, the privacy uh, of, of users, right? 
That's the question. And uh, I'm going to talk briefly about two approaches here uh, that are, and both of these are sort of ongoing projects in a lab. So there's lots of loose ends, and, uh, and uh, I'm giving you kind of a sneak peek right now uh, of some of the, the work that we're looking at. So uh, the first approach is um, uh, being looked at by Leila, who's uh, one of my colleagues over in France, and uh, an intern that we've had a couple of times, actually, Platon. So uh, the idea that they want to pursue is looking, at finding command and control traffic and knowing exactly what, what botnet you're dealing with by looking at the encrypted uh, command and control traffic. And the reason we think this is feasible uh, is because there's been lots of previous work that has shown that looking at the details of the TLS handshake, and this is the unencrypted part, like before while you're negotiating this, the symmetric key that you're going to use. Um, that you can fingerprint 70% of benign applications. So just sitting on the network, I can sort of look at the TLS handshake and say, hey, that's, that's Chrome talking, or, or that's uh, some other process uh, that, that's talking. So that that's shows that you know, it is feasible to fingerprint uh, using TLS handshake. And there's been some work on doing this for um, looking for malware traffic, uh, but it has typically suffered from a lot of false positives. Um, so they're looking at some of the features in this TLS handshake and not others, and they're sort of ignoring what we think are some other useful features. Uh, so the approach here would be to, uh, to take lots of features out of those handshakes, including you know, what Cypher suites are supported, whether there's elliptical curve support, um, and there's uh, some various other TLS extensions uh, that you can kind of look at to try and get a sense. Uh, and the other thing is, looking at the sort of fingerprint of the traffic shape, okay? So what are the size of the packets uh, in these flows? And what's the inner arrival time between the different messages and the packets within those flows? And uh, like I said, this is very preliminary work. So out of those 1.7 million um, that we've identified that use it, I think they've looked at uh, somewhere in the tens, low tens of thousands of these so far and run some experiments using some of these features and found that they're having kind of 90% accuracy in classifying. So those are early numbers. I don't want to promise that we can definitely do that, but, uh, but it's looking super promising uh, that, that this is possible. So that's great because we preserve privacy completely. We never need to decrypt the traffic. Uh, we just can observe the features of the traffic and the unencrypted portion at the beginning uh, and sort of be fairly confident about whether or not this is some sort of malware traffic that we need to block. But there are some kinds of security that you want to apply that are absolutely, uh, you're, you're just going to need to decrypt the traffic, okay? So um, typical intrusion detection systems are like this. You have like regular expressions and things that you're looking for in the, uh, in the network stream, and so you can't do that on an encrypted network stream. Another use case that's very important in, uh, in enterprises, in, in big companies, uh, is data leakage prevention, right? You need to see that uh, there's a couple of situations here. It could be a malicious uh, insider that's trying to leak your company secrets, and there's a legitimate need to try and stop that from happening. Um, there's also the case that you could have uh, malware, uh, an advanced persistent threat, or some kind of malware that's infected one of your employees' laptops, and is then trying to reach out and exfiltrate sensitive customer data. And so this is how data breaches happen, right? And this is a big deal. And so data leakage prevention products try and stop that by looking at the, the, uh, the, the data that's going out and seeing whether or not there's anything that looks sensitive. It's a lot harder to do that when you have uh, the encrypted, uh, encrypted traffic. So uh, I'm not sure if you're aware today, but many, of, uh, many big companies deploy these middle boxes that uh, actually decrypt uh, the encrypted traffic from their employees' laptops in order to do just these things. Uh, and the way it happens is basically on all of the company-issued devices, they install a, uh, a, a trusted root signing certificate. It doesn't really belong to any real signing authority. It just belongs to this middle box. Um, but that means that the middle box can generate certificates that the endpoints trust. So every TLS connection that gets created is actually two of them. One is using the genuine certificate on sort of the upstream side from the middle box. Uh, and then there's a fake certificate used on the, uh, between the middle box and the client. This allows the middle box to decrypt things and, and uh, apply security controls in the middle. Um, also interesting here is that this is actually fairly heavyweight, right? Because you have two different connections. That means there's lots of encryption and decryption going on. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty heavyweight process. 
So this is all well and good from the company's point of view, but obviously it presents a couple of problems. Um, the employees might not be too happy about this for a number of reasons. Um, some of the problems are listed here. So there's the visibility problem. You have no idea whether or not this is actually happening. Um, is the request that I'm presenting to a server actually getting there without being changed, or is the middle box changing that request in some way? How about the response I'm getting back? Has that been modified? I'm not sure, and, and there might be mu multiple middle boxes in the middle, so I don't know who's looking at my traffic and who might be changing it. And the biggest problem, obviously, is this privacy problem. Um, what's supposed to be end-to-end -end encrypted is now being monitored by someone. And I don't know who might have seen this decrypted traffic. Can the admin of that middle box actually somehow peek in there and see my sensitive transactions? Um, and there's actually, the companies care about this too because they're by um, uh, various laws and things not supposed to be looking at medical transactions. So if you're talking to your insurance provider and signing up for your medical insurance, they're not supposed to be monitoring that. Your banking transactions, they want no part of that. They don't want to be involved in any kind of potential uh, problem with, uh, with your, your bank. So, uh, right, so this is a problem. And, and all of the middle boxes, including one that's sold by Symantec, says we're not, you know, we offer features that will not inspect those things. So, so don't worry. But it's a little bit, you know, trust me, there's like kind of no guarantee about that. <clears throat> so we'd like to improve that situation a little bit. Um, so consider an alternative uh, sort of approach to doing this. Um, instead of doing this man-in-the-middle attack, which is essentially what the current state of the art is, uh, let's have sort of a two-phase setup here, where the, the first stage is that the endpoint in the middle box sort of negotiate uh, an agreed-upon inspection policy. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about this attestation portion later. So once they've agreed on what the policy for inspection is, then uh, the endpoint can connect to the server and do its regular TLS handshake, just a single connection with the genuine certificate. And, uh, but then, after this sort of uh, public key, private key negotiation where they manage to agree upon a symmetric uh, session key, I'll pass the session key over to the middle box as the client. I'll pass that over there, and then the middle box can go ahead and inspect uh, the encrypted payload according to the agreed upon policy. Okay, so just from that flow, you can see that now the visibility problem that we mentioned before is kind of gone. You know, we, we know there's a middle box there. We had to negotiate it with it. We're actually handing it the keys to our traffic explicitly. Um, but why should I? Why should I do that? Why should I trust it? So we still have this problem of, do I trust that the middle box is doing uh, the right thing? And the idea is that we'd like the, the client to be able to verify that that middle box code only inspects the traffic that, that it told me it was going to inspect through its inspection policy. Um, that if the traffic is, if it, if it tells me that it hasn't been inspected, uh, then I know that my secrets aren't revealed to the admin of the box, to the company that manufactured the middle box, or anyone else. Uh, and uh, yeah, and we, and we know exactly which things have been inspected. So I, I don't know if I mentioned on here, we're also going to return to the client for each connection. Yes, we inspected this because we thought there might be a potential security problem. No, we didn't inspect this. And if we had to change it in some way, you know, we replaced this with a message that says you're not allowed to visit this site or something like that. You know, we would tell them that as well. Um, so one step in this direction would be, okay, we open source all of our middle box code. There's some problems with this. Um, the first problem is, is purely commercial, right? The people who, who make these middle boxes, they have, they don't want to let their secret sauce recipe out to the world, right? So, and there's, uh, so that it gives them a commercial advantage that they have good detection technology, and they don't want to open source that. Also, if you, these are actually pretty complicated boxes. So if you open source that whole thing, it's not going to be easy to verify that. Um, either through, definitely not through formal verification, and even through like inspection. I mean, there's going to be bugs in it. You're not, it'd be hard to tell what it's doing. So you would kind of be more confident, but maybe not totally confident that it's doing the right thing. Besides that, that huge effort of verifying it would have to be repeated for every different middle box out there. So the idea that we'd like to explore is how can we actually split up this middle box code in a useful way? where we have a reusable and verifiable middle box kernel, hopefully formally verifiable, but if not, at least uh, you know, reasonable size to be vetted manually, um, that would support different inspection policies depending on uh, for different types of middle box functionality, and would provide these desired guarantees to the client. That is, that I'm obeying the inspection policy, and that I will tell you honestly whether or not I inspected something, <coughs> or whether or not something might have been exposed. 
Uh, and so, so that's the idea. Um, and the one of the tools that we would use to, to do this is you may have heard of Intel SGX. And this would work with other forms of trusted hardware as well. So um, the idea here basically at the high level for SGX is that it provides a um, these secure enclave environments in which um, code can execute without being visible to the admin of the machine or even to the operating system that's, that's underneath uh, or to any other code that's running on the machine. Uh, and this is sort of guaranteed by the the hardware, so if you trust Intel, you sort of trust that this is, uh, that this is working properly. Uh, and then the, the other feature that's important that we would use is this remote attestation piece. Uh, so you can uh, basically create a hash of the code that's running and send that over and, and uh, to the client, and the client can say, yes, if I, if I trust Intel again, then I trust that I'm speaking with a genuine Intel processor and that it's running exactly the code that it just told me it was running. And so in that way, since we have this open source verifiable kernel, we would be able to convince the client that's what we're running and that's what you're communicating with. And when it tells you that it's got a particular inspection policy, that's, that's what the inspection policy is. Uh, so this is kind of what the architecture would look like. You'd have um, uh, this privilege separation between the specialized detection logic that's outside of the enclave and this generic kernel which is running inside the enclave. By, by the way, that's another reason why we want to keep this, um, this kernel small, not only because it would be more easy to verify, but also because there are sort of limitations to how much you can run at, with good performance uh, within an enclave. Uh, the, the kernel would be responsible for decrypting all of the traffic um, and looking to see whether or not any of these inspection policies uh, would uh, have been triggered. And if so, it would then pass that plain text traffic off to the uh, detection logic inside the, uh, the specialized logic. Uh, so that's, that's what the architecture looks like. Now also, I'd like to mention, we'd like to make this so that just saying that you don't uh, inspect my bank transactions and transactions with medical providers or my insurance is still not all that great. I'm still not all that happy about it as an employee at a company, right? So we think that there could be a much stronger, this could open the door to having much stronger policies. And we actually borrowed an idea for some previous work um, uh, out of Berkeley on uh, probable cause inspection. And so the idea here is that you sort of divide this detection into first looking for probable cause, which hopefully would be a simple check that we could do in this small kernel. Uh, and then the more complicated logic that would sort of weed out any false positives and say, oh, we thought this could be bad, but it's not actually bad, could happen outside. Um, and, and so that, that would be sort of the model that we would advocate for. And you can see there's a whole range uh, on that from, from sort of having no probable cause uh, where you basically expose all the traffic and that has the smallest possible kernel but provides no privacy all the way up to having all of the middle box logic inside the kernel, uh, which would expose the least amount of plain text, but it, it results in a much more uh, complicated kernel. So in summary, um, we think that we can uh, balance, am I running out of time by the way? Okay. <laughs> uh, we can uh, try to balance the need uh, to secure encrypted traffic with the end user's desire for privacy with this sort of new model, uh, where you require the explicit communication you specify and agree to these probable cause inspection policies ahead of time, uh, and then by separating it into this, uh, this kernel that's responsible for, um, for doing the auditing and enforcing of the inspection policy, and then the separated uh, specialized detection logic, and levering, leveraging SGX, we think that this is a, a more compelling vision for how we might be able to get this to work in the future uh, in a more satisfying way. So that is it, and I'd be happy to take any uh, any questions that you have about that or anything else. Um, yeah, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was interested in the SGX uh, part. Um, actually, I'm also working on SGX, but um, I noticed that you are separating the detection logic from the enclave. And is there a reason why do you do that? Is it because like you want to limit the space that you put inside the enclave? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons. Uh -huh. um, the other reason is, is because 
we, uh, you know, in a, in a capitalistic, selfish way, don't necessarily want to expose all of that logic uh, to, it's only useful if the client can verify that the code that they're talking to is doing what it expects it to, right? Yes. So you basically have to open source uh, everything that's inside the enclave. But no, I, you only, the client will only receive the MR enclave value, which is the hash of the code, which doesn't mean that it would have to have the access to all it the code. It wouldn't have to have the access to all the code, but how does it know that the code with that hash does what it wants it to do? Because you could, the you hash could, is already, the, the hash, the, 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 the MR enclave value is all the, the hash of the, all the code. Yes, so, yes. so it, it knows the identity of the code, Yes. but if it doesn't have the actual code that has that hash, then it doesn't know what you're running. I could be running, you know, leak everything to the NSA uh, and then <laughs> sign that and say, here's the hash value that you want to talk to, and then I'm leaking everything to the NSA. Um, so that's why the open sourcing, it's kind of a different way than, like SGX is often used where you, uh, for like digital rights management and things like that, where you don't, where it's, it's not the client that cares what's running, it's the, it's the corporation that cares what's running. And we're kind of flipping that around here and saying, no, it's, it's actually the, the person who cares about their privacy is the one that cares what's running here. And so you kind of need to make the code open source. And that's one of the reasons. The other reason is what you said exactly, like you're resource constrained in an SGX enclave. So we don't want to put it all in there. Um, and I had a third reason, but that's leaving me right now. But that, that's the main thing. Yeah? Um, you're making the keys inside SGX as well? Yes, so the, the symmetric key would be passed directly to the, the enclave inside SGX. So do you have any studies on like, how would you expire it or like, replace the keys? Or so uh, do you mean, they, so generally these session keys are per, uh, per connection. And they can be upgraded or changed during the connection and we would have to handle that. Uh, our current prototype doesn't. It's kind of, Takes, uh, it takes the initial handshake and passes the symmetric key over, and we're not handling kind of upgrades or switches of keys, but we can definitely do that through the, uh, through the protocol. And then we would basically discard it as soon as that connection ended, uh, unless we were supporting some kind of session resumption, which also complicates things a little bit too. But, uh, but yeah, I think all of those things are handleable. Yeah. Uh, so um, in the latter half of your talk, you're building this uh, a minimal kernel so that you can do either some deep manual inspection or actually formally verify it. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent have you tried any of those, especially the formal verification, and what has been your experience with that? We have not attempted the formal verification at all, and that is going to be the most, that would be kind of uh, interesting and probably the most difficult thing, right? It's very difficult to do. Um, I would imagine that we would, uh, I have some small experience years ago in sort of doing automated theorem proving and sort of using proof assistant to try and go back and forth and, and verify some things. So that would be ideal for me, um, and I think that would be interesting academically. Practically, I think the inspection policies are going to want to be a little bit more complicated that would be hard to do with formal verification. Um, some of the examples I think I had up there were like, you know, detecting whether or not the payload looks like it, an executable file and only then exposing it, and that, that's starting to sound like something that's just getting beyond the realm of, of formal verification to me. For the uh, analysis of metadata on encrypted traffic, you said you could have an accuracy of like 90%. I'm wondering what the false positive rate is, and what would you do at that given accuracy level? Would you just block all that traffic and hope legitimate requests were resent? Yeah, that's a, um, that is a good question. I think it would depend. So first of all, those were, those were preliminary results that we were seeing. And so 10% uh, incorrect is, is, not, is not great. Um, but uh, like typically, you know, we're, we're pretty, um, at Symantec at least, we tend to be very careful about blocking traffic because users get mad if you, uh, if you block things that are legitimate. Uh, and so we like things up at 99% you know, and, and up. So we would hope that we could get that better if we try different uh, ML techniques, essentially. Um, but, but yeah, what you're asking is a, is a great question. I think it would depend on the situation, right? You can, you can imagine a dial whereby if you're in a particular, if you're in a particularly secure uh, government agency or something, you might block that traffic absolutely. Um, but if you were, uh, you know, somewhere where it was a little less important, maybe you turn it down. Um, yeah, or, or maybe, maybe there's some way that you can then try to force that traffic through something that would actually do the decryption, which your command and control stuff would not agree to do that. 
um, but legitimate traffic might be willing to do that, right? So you could kind of fall back to that second technique, perhaps. Yeah? Did you do any more digging into the uh, TLS fingerprints? Mm -hmm. It kind of seems a little odd that the malicious service won't try to sort of uh, mimic uh, a benign server, right? So that's, like why would they, uh, that's a great uh, question. And um, I will just reflect what I've heard Layla say in talks, because she did this work, right? And she has said that what her experience has been is that every time they try and evade it or mimic something else, it actually becomes even more detectable. Uh, I don't know about mimicking. That's actually a very good question. The question that I've, I've heard her answer is about trying to evade it or alter their, their behavior not to match the fingerprint that you've learned. Uh, and that is... Um, yeah, so that, that ends up sending signals, apparently, that end up being also detectable. Uh, but this is a great question, and it comes to that first topic that I said we think is so important, which is the robustness of ML uh, against attacks. Uh, because this essentially is just a classifier that's trying to classify this traffic, and you want that model to be robust to any type of, of changes that, uh, that might be made. Uh, so can you comment a little bit about like, the new um, network encryption uh, mechanism, like uh, HCD2? quick uh, on, your, uh, on your scheme. So uh, what I know is like, for example, HTTP2 made some change about how these like, uh, uh, transaction sessions being combined and there are many, have many change on the features that we are using. So, yeah. so look, the way that I see this is that it is sidestepping a lot of those issues by, uh, by allowing the handshake to proceed however the protocol wants it to. At the end of the day, you're going to have a, a, a symmetric key that you're using, uh, and you're going to negotiate that in some way, and then use that to encrypt and decrypt your traffic. And so, yes, there may be changes in this sort of side protocol whereby that's exchanged with the middle box, and it may happen more often. Maybe there's multiple for a connection because there's multiple connections being multiplexed over, uh, you know, over something. Um, but I think all of those things are more likely to be feasible. Uh, and with lower overhead than any of the other uh, techniques that people suggest where you're actually modifying the protocol to allow the middle box inspection, which is actually a no-go anyway because everybody raises bloody murder when you try and do that. Um, so so, uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking that because we're sort of at that lowest level, we can tolerate any of these new protocols. And the TLS 1.3, where you have sort of more, uh, more and more encrypted zero round trip uh, establishment sessions and things like that. So have you have you talked about the, so, so, so about uh, how you handle the uh, certificate of kinning, um, the practice, which is actually pretty popular now in I think in even in the in Android phone, it's better one. Right. So so this again is something that we wouldn't have to deal with with this. Mm -hmm. We we are very worried about it in yes. terms of the middle box, the traditional way where you do the man in the middle attack. Yeah. Um, both certificate pinning and TLS uh, 1.3 cause problems yeah. for that approach, which means that we're actively looking uh, for, for new approaches to handle that. Um, the certificate pinning, though, we haven't had, like even Chrome started to do certificate pinning and then stopped, and I don't know all their motivations behind it, but I think that part of it is that this practice is so common yeah. That uh, that yeah. people don't pin their certificates because they know that it's not it's not going to work. Also, it's just hard to manage. But for Android, it's it's, it's already it's doing exactly. that. So yeah. probably, if you want to do that, probably you want, you want to ask the employee to give you the root, the root access and then to change the yeah. yeah. But that may may, may be way like like intrusive in some sense. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Should we should we wrap so up here? Let's thank again our speaker. Thank you.